Welcome back to the Space Salvi Institute podcast. I'm Andrew Pettiprin with Bobby Mixa. Bobby, how are you? I'm good, Andrew. You know, I, I told myself before we were going to record that I wasn't going to talk about the weather, but golly, is it raining here in Krakow? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the deluge. So uh, how is it in, in Texas? Do you guys have uh, the monsoons yet? No, it's it's pretty pretty balmy down here. So still enjoying the non-winter. The little bit of winter we had was too much for me. So glad to be back to more civilized temperatures. Today, Bobby, did you know, is the hour of the weirdos. I, I and is that some invented thing? Or, it's, it's, or? A, it's the hour of the weirdos. And joining us to tell us about the hour of the weirdos is our good friend, Larry Chap. Larry, how are you? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Chief among weirdos. And I hate winter. It's the invention of the Antichrist, probably Satan. And uh, I, I, envy, <laughs> I envy those who are in warm climates. Yeah, Larry, I really I appreciate, you know, I always it, it always warms my heart when I, I, I put some silly tweet out there and I see I see your I see that you like it and you liked one of my tweets about the evils of winter. So we are we are brothers and uh you know I, I think kindred spirits in this weirdo endeavor that we might talk about today. Um yes. something a, a jumping off point maybe for our conversation today is I was telling Bobby, I I loved your recent article on your blog. I know you publish all over the place and you write such great stuff for Catholic World Report, but you still keep up your blog, your 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 Gaudium et Spes 22 blog, which is always has great stuff on it. And you recently published a piece on there called The Falsification of the Good, Part 3, Mr. Cogito's Monster and the Prolepsis of Heaven and Hell, which was just uh was just terrific. I I really I really loved it. It had so many ideas that um that are things that I tried to develop and Bobby and I have talked about in our, in our project here at the Space Alvey Institute. Um, let's start, let's start in a weird, since we're talking about weirdos, let's start in a weird, in a weird place. Let's start with teeth. You want to start with teeth? Um, I had this, uh, I had this thought recently where I said to my wife, I swear to you, Larry, this is, I'm not making this up. I said to my wife, have you ever noticed now that all like kind of elite people have the same teeth? They all like they all they all like there's no one if you walk on the campus of Harvard University right now and you asked every single student on campus, I get I bet you none of them would tell you they didn't have braces. I bet you every single student on that campus would tell you that they had braces. Maybe I'm just prejudiced because I have a, an underbite and like I've just always lived with that. And I'm, I'm like really proud of the fact that I never had braces and my teeth are healthy, but maybe not, you know, maybe not like newscaster worthy or whatever. But you you in your piece here you actually make the you actually adduce this example of kind of like the the smile right of the of this sort of utopian smile so let's let's start let's start with that what's what's wrong with everybody's teeth looking the same well it's it first off it, it evinces the whole problem with the technological paradigm of society uh, everything has to be of a certain standard there there can be no uh disnormativity with regard to our teeth we make fun of the i once my daughter studied in in the uk and i once asked her how the weather was over there and she goes oh it's horizontal just like all the men's teeth that are over here and <laughs> not to, and uh, you know and it, you know it, it points to the fact and i was kind of happy that people and men in the uk don't have perfect teeth you know i, I make the point in the, in the thing that what we're moving into is an era of robots and perfect orthodontia or uh, robots with perfect orth orthodontia and it's not just that they're straight andrew perfectly straight they're perfectly white too uh, and the elites in our society can afford to go to the dentist and have their teeth bleached and whitened and perfectly straightened and and filed down to perfect sizes so yeah it's it's indicative of our of how homogenized we become in a technocratic society. Yeah, and can I just add one thing, Bobby? Before you jump in, Bobby, you have such great teeth. So I, I, I don't want I, 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 <laughs> yeah, you not. To I'm, a, I'm a little self conscious because my mom uh, was convinced by the orthodontist that I would end up like Lisa Simpson. Uh, I don't know if you remember that episode when they show the progression of her her teeth that she doesn't get braces, but they're like going to stick out of side of the parts of her head. So, um, yeah, I, I don't worry, Andrew. No, and look, chap, no offense taken. Uh, I just, I, 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 I blame it on that orthodontist. He was actually quite a good salesman. So, well, no, don't, don't be ashamed. You look good, Bobby, but let me just add one more thing. And then I know you want to jump in too, but 
Uh, one of the reasons why I, I find that such a, a great observation, Larry, is whenever whenever any one of us critiques kind of the cult of scientism or the march of progress, or, you know, we ask ourselves, you know, the question of uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm from uh, Jurassic Park about whether, you know, whether we should, you know, we were so busy wondering if we could do something that we didn't stop to ask why people will almost, it's so funny that modern dentistry is one of those examples where they say, what, you want to live in a world without modern dentistry? Are you crazy? <laughs> you know, progress is good. Technology is good. Like, it's just funny that that is an example that is so often used. Um, so what a funny kind of, yeah. you know, emblem that that we we can point to that as like an example of this, like flattening out or something, you know? Oh, it's it's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, I too have that underbite and I probably should have had you know, braces when I was a kid to correct the underbite. Thankfully, my parents didn't have a lot of money and they had five kids. <laughs> so. We, yeah. we did without we may we may do without the braces well we share a good strong look together larry so you know what with the hair and the beard and the jaw so you know well, we'll so just... that raises a point too i was just reading a great book by uh uh barta his last name is barta he's a philosopher and it's a sort of anti-technology sort of thing and what he points out in there is that if you oppose any technological advancement at all you are then identified at, with the problem that the technology is meaning to get rid of. So if you're opposed to super monitoring of traffic and everything in your car monitored and your personal demeanor monitored and your heart rate monitored, blah, 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 well, if you're opposed to that, that means you're in favor of drunk drivers. Uh, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> but, you know, you get the point. Yeah, speaking of that book, you know, you mentioned it. Uh, I forget it was, was it with Mark. Uh, your, Mark Stallman. Yeah. It's called um, A Web of Our Own Making, A Web of Our Own Making. Yeah. So I got, uh, speaking of technology, I downloaded a sample of that book and started to read it. And it's really good. But yeah, kind of that whole point. I mean, um, any type of criticism is is actually met with like the most egregious response with, well, well what would you, you know, then you you must be for this, 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 and this. It's it's so yeah. interesting how today it's like you have to show your allegiance to all the blessings of technology or else you're like against the salvation of mankind. Yeah. So if you're opposed to everybody having perfect orthodontia, then that means you're opposed to dentistry at all. And and therefore, you know, you're you're a Luddite from hell. And this this is, you know, this is part of the technological imperative as well. One of the things that pushes technology and the tech, you know, what we have the power to do, we will do, and we should do is, is part of it is human sinfulness in this regard. Mm -hmm. Human sinfulness creates competition, especially amongst world powers. And so in the modern world, say in the United States, if we say we're going to develop AI so that it does X, Y, and Z, and a lot of us are like, wait a minute, that has really bad implications. Then the powers that be say, well, too bad. If we don't do it, the Chinese will. So mm -hmm. somebody's going to do it anyway. And the Chinese are over there saying, well, we better do this or the Americans will. And so everybody has a sense of once the technology, technological genie is out of the bottle, once that toothpaste is out of the tube, you, can't, you cannot put the technology back away because somebody somewhere is going to do this. So we better do it first. Yeah, yeah. But uh, did yep. you end up reading, sorry, the, 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 the very end of that book that you say he ends on a pretty dire note saying there's really nothing we can do about this. Right. He says we're essentially screwed. Yes. <laughs> because, well, let, let's put this in. Here's, here's why he says that, for example. I resisted for many, many, many years when cell phones, and I don't mean smartphones, when cell phones first came out. I resisted having a cell phone. No way. I didn't want to be tied to the darn things until it eventually got to the point where you cannot live and work and move within the being of the modern world unless you have a cell phone number, unless you have some. And then it was true of smartphone and try to get on in the world without an email address uh, and that kind of there are there are now. I mean, we're rapidly moving towards a cashless society where everything's going to be. Uh, done through, you know, you're probably gonna have a chip in your wrist that you have to bang at a Walmart and say, okay, there I'm paid. So yeah, this is what he means. He means there's a, there's a matrix, a nexus, a web, a web of our own making. So we weaved and we weaved this web and it's now we're just, we've woven ourselves right into it. And there's no 
opting out unless you want to become a Unabomber living in a shack in Montana. Yeah. I mean, this is, and this is, uh, I think it's becoming increasingly clear, at least to to some of us. And you get into it, not that I'm identifying with the kind of type of saint that the the new, that that we need in our new reality. But I mean, there, there do seem to be more and more people who kind of see this. Um, and, but what are we going to do about it? it? It's really, it really is a, an intractable problem. It seems, it seems to me. And this, this leads me to the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is, um, you know, you'll often hear people say, I even used to do this myself probably about 10 years ago, where, you know, you, you look out at the world and you see how bad things are, or the church for that matter, and you say, we've been through bad times before. You know, we've had tough times and, you know, this is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And, you know, we, this is just the latest iteration and all that kind of thing. You you make the case, and I, I'm I, I'm I'm with you on this. I've I'm totally come over to this side that we are witnessing something entirely new. That what we have before us is the door has been kicked open to the return of the old gods, to you know, that that something something that really the kind of the the spirit of Antichrist, the way that it manifests now is is something that that our ancestors did not know. Uh, and we're not really prepared to deal with it. Would you, would you maybe elaborate on that? Sure, absolutely. The fact of the matter is, is that, yeah, we, we've had tough times before, and, and I, but I have very little time with those who want to point out, you know, same as it ever was, as the David Byrne song said, same as it ever was. Well, yeah, there are certain analogous points of contact between the crisis we face today and the crisis of our of our forefathers. Human nature doesn't change that drastically. What what has changed in a foundational and constitutive way in the modern world is that we now have the te technological capacity to reshape human nature from the ground floor up. And it is precisely the scientific and technological revolution, right down to being able through CRISPR technology to manipulate our genetic code on the most fundamental levels. I mean, just look at the mRNA vaccine. It's not even a vaccine, the COVID vaccine, right? It's a form of genetic therapy that goes in and alters is, is certain key aspects of this, of the mechanisms of, of, of your cells. You know, we, we might have had certain crises of geopolitics or pandemics and so forth in the 15th century, the 13th century, but never, ever have we had this kind of power to absolutely, and not just to reshape human nature uh, from the inside out biologically, but to alter the very structure and form of human consciousness through the use of virtual reality technologies that are, I mean, just the other day, the big splash with the new Apple vision thing. So now people are going to be walking around all day long with this thing strapped to their face. And as they're looking at you, they're getting digitized information about who you are and what that book on your shelf is. And, and, and it's just incredible. I mean, Soshana so Zuboff wrote a great book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And that yeah. book is now maybe 10 years old and out of date. But the collusion of big government, big corporate power and, and big tech coming together to create this this web of our own making, this nexus, uh, out of which we cannot opt. And that's the difference. We will not be able to opt out of it. A hundred years ago, 200 years ago, whatever crisis faced society, you could always opt out of it uh, in various ways and various. I'm just not going to participate in that. But that is no longer possible. And that that's the problem. Furthermore, I don't think we've ever reached a civilizational state where uh, God has been so eclipsed and so nullified. The transcendent has now been transformed into uh, the enemy as to an, uh, a distortion of our nature. So there have been eras where faith in God has ebbed and flowed. There have been eras where religious observance has ebbed and flowed. All right. But never before have we ever had an entire society predicated upon the idea that God does not matter. And not only that God does not matter in terms of our social construct, but that any construct of God, if it claims any social purchase whatsoever, is dangerous. So I go back to the, the thesis of Christopher Dawson and his various uh, analyses. There can be no civilization and no culture without cult, without religion. And religion and cult is what drives every, every culture. Western culture was created by the cultus provided by Christianity, Catholicism in particular. That is now dead, dead yeah. as a social, as a social, having social warrant. Therefore, we've nullified God 
And when I, I say nullify in this more than we don't believe in God, nullify means at its very root, our society says, not only do we adhere to the idea that God doesn't exist, we adhere to the notion the very idea of God is completely irrelevant, and those of you who are bringing it up are therefore dangerous to the social contract. That's where we are now, and that's how we're different. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, um, I think last time we talked, we mentioned um, uh, Eugene McCrear's book. Um, and uh, what's the title? The Enchantments uh, of Mammon. The Enchantments of Mammon. And in that book, he met, he looks at uh, the education of Henry Adams. And Henry Adams in that book writes about um, going to see all these generators. Um, and uh, I think it's maybe in the World's Fair. And then he it just strikes him that this is the new... This is the new religion of the age. It just encapsulated right here. And he contrasts the generators, the power of the generators, with the power of the virgin, uh, the Madonna with child. I think that's I, I think that's in yeah. the section. Um, but I mean, that that kind of sociology that for someone to actually pick up on like what is the the religion of our day today, I mean, it's really fascinating if somebody like Henry Adams, somebody like a Christopher Dawson. Uh, could could see this, and it's just it's it's very sad that still we see these things like technology, whatever you want to, however you want to think about it, but to see it not just as like a device or even a way of thinking, but it claims you it it claims almost in some ways your worship um, in a way. And I'm thinking of like a really really good book that was written. Right before, or I think it was maybe written in the 1930s, actually, Nick Healy, um, uh, Nicholas Healy at the John Paul II Institute, um, who, Andrew, we got to have a Nick Healy on uh, eventually, too, because if he responds to emails. <laughs> I, I think, he does uh, not respond to emails. <laughs> I, I well, tried that's... to get him on my show. Good luck. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's living off the grid, I guess. But um, anyways, he recommended... And the translation of the book was The Failure of Technology by Ferdinand Junger. But the book, I think, in German is like Das Perfection, uh, or the whatever it is in German, the, the perfection of technology, which is actually, in some ways, the oppression also of man and kind of the, the uh, I think, I think as, the, as, the, as he argues throughout the book, it in some ways destroys many of these human things that we haven't. I, I think that they republished that book recently and it's very like there's little short insights, but he's on to something. And I don't think he could publish that when the, the Nazis were in power, but he kind of sees, he saw like really what was happening um, with this kind of erosion of, of, of the human. Uh, so I just, yeah. I, I really, like with this this question of the uh, not even caring about the question of God anymore, or suppressing those who even bring up God, um, do you think most people like what do we do with with many Catholics who just think it's a matter of proving the existence of God? It's just not that like. For example, like, okay, well, we just got to give you, you know, some logical proof. So go read a couple, you know, Robert Spitzer books or go read Ed Fazer. And I think, I think like Ed, for example, Ed Fazer's book's really good. Um, but sometimes I think it's like, okay, that's not even, we're not even there anymore. I mean, yeah, maybe there will be some people who will be receptive to that. So it has a place. But for the, for the most part, to even say I'm going to prove the existence of God it just and we even have something like reason, like we can actually come together to actually come to a conclusion about this is is a threat. Yeah, it is seen as a threat. And unless those kinds of arguments for God's existence, and I agree, phasers are good, uh, it, unless they begin to gain a majority hold on on our academic institutions, those arguments are never really going to trickle down uh, to to the average person. So what we're left with is is a culture. Uh, you, you have to ask then the question: what would what would drag this culture kicking and screaming back to some semblance of faith in God? A faith in God that held that we ought to construct our social plausibility structures around around this con this Christian concept of transcendence. We need to reorder society around that. You can't go back to some integralist model of the top down, we're just going to impose the faith on everybody. You can't do that. 
uh, and and yet we so you have to create broad cultural conditions. Well, that means that the elites of our society, the 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 educated, the powerful, the wealthy, that they have to be in on the reconstructing of our culture from the ground up, and and that's why there's a sense of pessimism, a sense of inevitable decline that guys like Adams and, and, and Dawson and a whole bunch of others from Guardini on through a whole bunch of others, Bouye, you know, saw was coming. It, it, you know, the, there's, there's handwriting in the wall here. And my lament, too, is that it has also then infected the church. This is also uh, the lament of the uh, Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, uh, whose small works I, I highly recommend, even though he's a bit esoteric and his relationship to the faith is ambiguous. Uh, his whole point is that the church has lost its eschatological sense, its sense of what's over the horizon. Everything, it has succumbed, in other words, to the realm of pure imminence. I mean, Charles Taylor's thesis of the buffered selves, that we live within a pure imminent frame, and that the construction of modernity is that we just can't bust out of this, but we need saints that can bust out of it. And, and that's what the, the modern church almost seems disinclined to do. It, it almost seems, for example, this papacy in, in particular, all right, wants to live within this latitudinarian horizontalist imminent frame and to construct a version of Catholicism that's purely therapeutic uh, and has no time for the, the rupture of the eschatological into our time and place. And this is Agamben's precise point. You cannot have a Christianity that doesn't have the provocation, the strong provocation, the anstfall moment of an eschatological inbreaking of the supernatural. A church that has lost that sense has lost its salty flavor. Yeah. I know you've, you've said in a few places, Larry, that... Um, you know the the way of the the way of talking that you'll hear sometimes from the church. It's well meaning, but you know this idea of meet them where they are. You know it's it's kind of absurd at this point because it's like where where is anybody? We're all nowhere. So yeah. meet meet somebody where they are. It's kind of strange. And then you know to your point too about like w w the church is posturing. You know um, it's I, I I find it, and I want to be careful here, but I mean I find it sort of ironic that Pope Francis has said, make a mess, um, when it seems Agalio. like the church, right, but when, and, and I'm, I'm for that, I, I want to make a mess, that sounds great, um, but it seems like the church is kind of more bureaucratic than ever, and more paralyzed by itself as an institution than ever, you know, it's just like, it's all, it, whether it's a pastor or a bishop or, or the Pope himself, it's all any of them can do until they hit 75, to just pull the levers of the old machine and there's more than enough levers to pull until they run out of strength. And so they're just going to keep doing it because what else, you know, it, it just seems like what else is there to do? I don't know. I'll just throw it back to you with that. No, with that idea. no it, it, it's, it's true. I mean, it, there's uh, several books out on the market now that are, that are excellent on this point. I'm thinking of the one from the University of Mary. I think it's called From Christendom to Apostolic Mission or something along those lines. And uh, it makes the distinction between... Uh, Christendom as a form of maintenance, and and then modern modern the modern need for evangelization that isn't maintenance Catholicism but evangelical that goes out of itself. It's it's rooted in a, a kenosis of descent into the modern condition that requires us to go out and so on to to break through the status quo and the comfortable and all that. But what we have, you're so right. We have a clerical class. And once again, I want to be careful here. I have many. I just interviewed Bishop Jim Conley yesterday. You know, for my way, good. I have good friends who are bishops. Uh, and there are some good ones out there. But nevertheless, I think as I'm going to speak general in general terms, our clerical class is mediocre intellectually, morally, in every other way. They're not necessarily evil people, but what they are is they're driftwood. They just love to float down the stream with the current cultural currents. And they're just happy if they can punch their time card, retire at age 75 and say, great, I only closed half the parishes in my diocese and we can still have mass at the rest of them and we still have enough priests. Good. Whew. We didn't get sued into oblivion. Whew. Good. I'm done. And, they, and like you said, that's just pulling levers. And there's still some there's still some levers left to pull. There's still some money in the coffers. But we all know 
that that form of Catholicism is dead. It is dead. And if we stay in that kind of status quo boredom, this is another big category of mine, the boredom of modernity imported into the church, we're just going to hemorrhage our way into non-existence. So we have to re-weird the church. We have to make it weird again, okay? And we have to have saints that are willing to be strange and bizarre. Balthazar said to be concentric to Christ is to be eccentric to the world. And I would then add to be eccentric to most of the church these days as well. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, you know, the, the call to sanctity. And you've mentioned a couple um, holy women who you identify as being models for our age. And one of them, um, you don't really hear very often mentioned, but I'm very attracted to her, um, you know, writings. Um, it's, it's Simone Weil. Um, oh, yeah. Particularly, I mean, you mentioned Dorothy Day as well, and and Madeline de Brel, as uh, I yeah. believe. And yeah. um, Simone Weil, yeah, when you read her, you really feel that punch. And I know some people are very kind of careful, you know, that I remember before I started reading her, everybody was like, okay, just be careful with Simone Weil. Uh, but man, is she radical? Does she get at the roots of the issue? Yeah. It, and, and the reason why I, and when I wrote about, wrote that blog, the reason why I put her first in that list of three women, I went to Simone Weil, Madeline Delbrell, and down to Dorothy Day. And, and it's precisely because I wanted to provoke the nasty responses that I got <laughs> because <laughs> she actually refused to be baptized. And so, of course, she, she, with full consciousness and full reason, refused baptism. And therefore, there is a certain kind of Catholic ever increasing in prevalence that they would say, well, she's almost certainly in hell right now because she had a chance to be baptized and explicitly repudiated it. All right. And, and so I think it, it calls into question some of our categories here. Let's just put it that way. I don't think she's in hell. In fact, I use her as an example of sanctity. And we need to examine why she refused baptism. And there is a sense in which she loved the Catholic. I mean, she was raised, her parents were Jewish, but she began to love the Catholic Church, was very attracted to the Catholic Church, and was at the same time repelled by the maintenance status quo Catholicism of her time that Andrew was talking about. And I think this was the major impediment that she had in her life to, to, becoming baptized, she felt like it was almost a betrayal of her solidarity with the poor, the dispossessed, the downtrodden, to accept baptism into an institution that aided and abetted that downtroddenness, <laughs> okay? Now, she, I think she was wrong about that, but my point is you can see from her, from her radical perspective, her, her deep desire to live in full solidarity with the absolute dregs of society why she would think that way. And yeah, obviously, I wish she had gotten baptized. And yet, 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 man, you're right. There's something, Peter Morin, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, said the church needs to blow up the dynamite that she's mm -hmm. sitting on. Well, Simone Weil was a piece of dynamite, you know? And I, I wish that we could at least capture uh, what she was on about, as the British say. Well, that's what she's on about, eh? All right, mm -hmm. if we could capture what she was on about, then I think we're on to something. Yeah, someone we, Bobby has, I think, admired for some time, and I'm just getting around to my admiration for him, is Charles Peggy, who I think has a similar, a similar yes. testimony. You know, I mean, somebody who s seemed utterly convinced of the truth of, of the faith um, at the time of his death, but also had a complicated relationship with the church right up to that moment. And I, I don't know, I find, and, and, his flavor is a little more to my liking just because of the whole kind of nation and civilizational aspect of it and stuff like that. So, but I think they're out there, these, these witnesses, right? Um, uh, there are, and I would even throw De Lubac in there. I mean, the yeah. fact is, I mean, there's a reason why I wanted to highlight some of these French as well. Uh, Sarah Shortell in her book, Soldiers of God, is pointing out that the, the, uh, so there's so much of that whole nature and grace debate between Lagrange and the, and the French Jesuits like uh, de Lubac has political antecedents. We need to remember that Lagrange was goose stepping around with Marshal Pétain down in Vichy, Vichy, France after the night. And it's not because he was a Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer. It's because he thought the Vichy government might restore the monarchy, might restore Christendom. And so he was part of Action Francaise, that whole political right wing monarchic movement. Whereas de Lubac was into Catholic action, which said, we, we got 
we got to rethink this whole thing, guys. Got to think the whole thing through. And Peggy was the same way. He, you know, he's talking about the mystique, um, you know, the mystique. Politic arises out of a mystique. Well, the church had been involved in the mystique of a certain kind of monarchic repression. Uh, and he didn't, you know, of course, Peggy didn't buy into the ideals of the French Revolution and laicite and all that kind of stuff either. But it only goes to show how complex, how complex things became for the French, for a Simone Weil, for a Peggy, for a de Lubac, when they're running up against a kind of Catholicism that was so complicit. I mean, just think of the Dreyfus affair. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like I said, Simone Weil was raised, it was her parents were lukewarm Jews, but Jew. All right. So you're, you're living in the France in the aftermath of the Dreyfus affair. And, you, and you're saying to yourself, well, this is not an institution that I necessarily want to be identified with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe just to follow up on that, um, unless you want to jump in, Bobby, I, I, I thought maybe we could go forward with the church stuff a little bit more on that I think picks up with what we've been talking about, about. So if what we need is sort of a, a, a dynamic faith blowing up the dynamite, the, 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 the real Christ, you know, the, the, the radical Christ, the, the, the Christ who demands all um, you make the point, Larry, in the article that I'm referencing, but I think in a lot of other places as well, that the committee is kind of guaranteed <laughs> to not let that Christ reign. I mean, almost guaranteed, it is by nature designed to tame that Christ and to stop, in a sense, like that movement of, of, this, of the spirit kind of move towards that Christ. Absolutely. I think I say committees are constitutively almost evil on an almost ontological level. Uh, and it, 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 it stemmed, it really, that thought stemmed from the fact I was reading Louis Bouillet's memoirs. And he was talking about how every committee that he was on, either get you know at the Second Vatican Council or in the post-conciliar liturgical reform committees, that he was just struck by how very, very little ever gets done in a committee. And that included the council itself. And not, I mean, he believes in ecumenical councils, but his, his point was in the church, in the Catholic church, where sanctity is the voice that needs to be heard the most, then it is quite often simply the saint, the single saint standing there in your midst who needs to be listened to and not some committee of because the very essence of a committee is to reach consensus. And consensus means you're going to blunt the prophetic. You are constitutively oriented towards blunting difference and anything might, that might hint at difference. So you're rounding off every single rough edge, every angular point. As I said, the facilitator's there to make sure nobody's running around the room with scissors in hand. All right, the safety first among all things, safety, safety. And therefore, where is the prophet going to emerge? Where is this? It, could you imagine a Dorothy Day or a Madeleine Delbro or a Simone Vey or a Charles Peggy on one, on one of those committees and what they, what they would have said? Uh, and, and this is key. I mean, and, and I think to a great extent what Bouillet was pointing to was that a lot of the post-conciliar turmoil that we saw was precisely the result of the fact that the council, though a great thing, and I'm a big supporter of the council, heck, my blog, got him at Spes 22, blah, blah, blah. All right, I don't mean it to say that it's invalid, but the, it's, and this is kind of true of most councils, but certainly of the Vatican Council, Vatican II. It, uh, it tried to quell, it tried to quell deep theological differences in the church via the path of some sort of conciliar consensus. And if you read about the council in any depth, then you see there were these constant debates that were unresolvable, that only, only got resolved with a majority vote of bishops on the floor of the, after the Pope appealed to unity. It was very clear that they were all simply trying to appease the pope make the pope happy okay the pope wants us to paper over our differences and we're going to vote for this document and as soon as the ink was dry on that paper and everybody went home from the council all of those theological divisions came back anyway the trads the progressives the communio types they remained at each other's throats anyway and so nothing about the giant committee called the second vatican council ultimately resolved any of those debates that are still with us. And but more deeply than that, I think Bouillet's point and my point in the blog is that it mutes sanctity and it mutes the prophetic. And what we need now more than ever are people who are pains in the butt. Mm -hmm. People who speak bluntly and frankly. 
And, uh, you know, and I like to include the three of us in that. And I, and there's a lot of chatter and there's a lot of fog in the Catholic blogosphere from people that are out there just clickbaiting around, throwing red meat to their base. But there are also a lot of people like you guys with the Space Albi Institute and stuff who are doing tremendously good things by simply speaking clearly, speaking the truth. And it strikes me that so much of it is percolating up from below, percolating up from the laity. And I think this is very important. You know, um, in your, I think you you mentioned Solovia, Vladimir Solovia, in your uh, latest piece. Um, and you know, I, when you mentioned committees, uh, and this is not to bash Vatican II or any ecumenical councils like that, but um, I always think about uh, his his uh, little short story called the Antichrist, in which um, this great figure calls this. It, what's it like an ecumenical council where all the differences, all the, the Orthodox yeah. will get exactly what they want. Catholics will get what they want. Protestants will get what they want. But there's one figure. Um, I think it's John who says, will, is it, is it, will you bend to the, the, the to the, your knee to Christ or to the name of Christ? What is it? And it gets right. To, I forget exactly what he says. The and elder maybe, John. Yeah. He says, you, yes. you need to bend your knee to Christ. Yes, and that's when the the mask and his face, his description of the Antichrist's face is so interesting. And then the mask is dropped, and then all of a sudden John drops dead. Um, and you just have it's like this this the and then it becomes this eschatological thing um, at the very end of the story. But that that short story and is so interesting because you know you had. Uh, Pope Benedict oftentimes would mention it. Um, yeah. I think Balthazar, too. Um, Balthazar mentions it. It's and, very important in their thinking. Yes, but we need, like, besides just the story, but even figures like Soloviev, who I think showed up in the Vatican and they thought he was a homeless guy outside of uh, just living on the streets of Rome. But his whole purpose, he felt like he had this mission of reconciling the Orthodox and the Catholics. Um, yes, he did. And it just, though, it's, it's striking to me, though, that, that people like that, who were very much focused on the eschatological, on that prophetic witness, are it's ex exactly what we need today. And it seems to me, Larry, like, if anybody's going to be remembering you, I mean, uh, you may be uh, up there with uh, Slobiev, just speaking, speaking truth uh, in a, in such a blunt way. <laughs> I don't know if, if I'm uh, sanctified for doing so, or if it's just part of my curmudgeonly nature. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've got I, I I try to speak clearly and bluntly. But to go back to Soloviev, I mean, I I read that his little short story in the Antichrist a long to many decades ago, but I was recently reminded of it by reading uh, uh, the book by the French historian Alain Besançon. I hope I'm pronouncing yeah. his name called the falsification of the good, which is where I got the title for this. And in, in that he also recounts, he talks a lot about Solovia and, and compares it a lot to also Orwell and what Orwell had to say about it's all, he's also pretty dead gum sort of pessimistic about the direction that the culture is going. Uh, and he believes the Solovia, both Solovia and Orwell were these prophets coming from completely different mindsets, mind you, completely different sets of motives and yet reaching very similar conclusions. But it's also in that book that I got introduced to the poetry of the, po the po Polish poet Herbert. Is that mm -hmm. how you pronounce his last name? Yeah, Herbert. Herbert. It's, uh, he, Herbert. He, he, Yes, Vignev, Mr. Or it's Vignev, uh Herbert. Um, yeah, Z what a combination of uh, Zbigniew <laughs> Herbert, Zbigniew Herbert. Yeah, uh, and his and his poem, you know, which is a long poem, Mister Cogito, Cogito, I don't know how to pronounce it, Mon his monster. And I was struck by Besançon's uh, analysis of that segment of the Pope that the po poem that I quote in my in my piece, which I thought. To me, it's absolutely haunting. It's mm -hmm. an extremely, when, when, for example, the line in there where he says something about the, the, the crisis that confronts us, the ethos that confronts us in modernity, covers us all like mold on, on bread, uh, mm -hmm. like the moldy bread. You know, I thought, God, what a, uh, the fog that permeates everything. What, 
what images, you know, and then there's, there's Mr. Kajito out there ready to fight the monster, but the monster refuses to show himself lest he valorize the very effort at resistance as and that and that's what i saw which i thought was so brilliant in in the poem and in besançon's uh, analysis is precisely that the, the nullification of god and modernity takes place in, in very very quiet subversive ways it's not like I said, a monster in red and tooth and claw, like old, like, you know, the French Revolution with priests getting guillotined. That's pretty in your face. We hate you. Uh, this is, we love you. You have these freedoms. Do whatever you want, but don't do this. All right. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and, and uh, you stay within the domesticated kennels that we have set up for you. Uh, and so it's like we've been lobotomized by modernity, and and that seems to be what this this poem I I is getting at. It's an altogether strange monster that poses as an angel of light. So there's a demonic, a demonic quality to it, and then it doesn't want to valorize the resistance at all. In fact, it wants to deny the very category of crisis. There is no crisis here. Run along, move along, same as it ever was. Everybody that thinks there's a crisis is a nut job, is a fanatic. So you need to beware those people. So it, it is a nullification of the whole category of crisis, of provocation, of eschatology. Uh, and and so anyway, you get the point. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and, and especially from the American perspective, we, we, um, we always run the risk of uh, overplaying our hand in the sense of, you know, if we complain too much about how people aren't taking the faith seriously anymore, or, or worse, you know, if the, the faith is somehow <clears throat> under duress or being persecuted by the, by secularism or something like that, then, you know, most, most people just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, what do you want? I mean, look, you can go to church. It's there. Nobody's stopping you. You know, it's like, really, it's almost like we, we long for a time when we're, you know, driven down into the catacombs or something and, and literally being made to choose on the spot yes or no for christ yeah and and the, the the cruelty is that that isn't happening you know the cruelty is like we're just gonna float along we're gonna the mold is on us you know we're just swimming in the water just like everybody else right yeah there's a great line in walker percy's book from many many decades ago lost in the cosmos where he talks about one of the one of the things of, of the modern world it's very bernanos like you see this i guess in these catholic literary figures their recognition that modernity is characterized by a certain boredom uh, mm -hmm. that w we have we have exchanged the well material well-being we've accepted that in exchange we we give away anything exciting in life or cutting edge anything that would make us live on the razor's edge with a sense of adrenaline and will i have enough food to eat today that that kind of existential razor's edge sort of living that everyone before our time most people lived it with him and so Percy says, we're always looking for substitute sources of excitement, and it usually takes the form of catastrophes. <laughs> he said he never saw his father happier than the day World War II broke out because it, it wasn't that he loved war. It's like, oh, good. Some, something is happening. <laughs> Some, something's going on. Something's going on here but besides the complete routinization of life and channelization of everything. Something bizarre and out of the ordinary has punctured through the cult of everydayness here. And, and I think that we, we see this in the, modern, in the modern world where I think people are screaming out for heroism. I think they want to be heroic. I think people want to live lives that break through this imminent frame, break through the boredom, break through the cult of everydayness. They want to. And you see it, for example, when there, whenever there's like a natural disaster, like in your neighbor, a tornado comes through and wipes out things, or there's a major flood, or there's been an earthquake. Watch how fast people come out of their little cul-de-sac homes to lend a hand, even to risk their lives, to suddenly meet their neighbors for the first time, seriously, to meet them for the first time. And there's an exhilaration there, there's an excitement because the bonds of community have been forged despite modernity's attempts to destroy the ties that bind. And so we see there is a profound reservoir of a desire for non-ordinariness, for weirdness, and for heroism. And if the church could tap into that, with saints that make the world weird again, but yeah. in, in the high register of, of creativity, 
there, you know, there's good, weird and bad. Weird. I like to say, you know, bad, weird is little kids that eat paste. I mean, good, weird, <laughs> good, weird is, you know, St. Simon, the stylite, <laughs> Simone Ve. That's kind of a good word weird because its orientation is to puncture the cult of everydayness. That's what those things to show us that the supernatural is here. It's real. And it's what will bind us together ultimately in ways that are meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, <laughs> No, yeah, go no ahead, Andrew, you go, you go. No, Bobby, it's your turn. You go. No, no, no. I, I really didn't have anything to, to follow. Well, let me l- let me say this then, and this may spark something for you too, Bobby. Like something, some a way that I think Larry, Bobby, and I have been thinking about trying to be weird with our project here at the Space Albi Institute is is to say, okay, as Americans, we're 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 patriotic Americans. We're not, you know, we're not. Uh, the last thing we would want to convey is that we are, you know, we don't believe in, in, um, you know, belonging to a country. And, and uh, I mean, my, my uh, family members died in wars for the sake of, you know, for the sake of this country. So that's, that's good. And that's important. And I'm also, you know, proud of the fact that America has a certain, has had a certain, uh, a certain genius in a way of of reconciling Catholics and Protestants and Jews and you know different different types of people in one land. However, it does seem that as you know as consumerism and tech and technocracy grows and grows and grows, it becomes more and more difficult to find any kind of like metaphysical it, it, the, the metaphysical glue that can bind together a place like America is is just is just gone. So one of the ways we we think about being weird is to point back to Europe, to point back to the old world to say, hey, we get it. Europe is way secular. You know, France is 10% Muslim and just, you know, just crazy with regard to all of that stuff. There's just all kinds of, I mean, talk about technocracy. I mean, the EU, good grief. I mean, it just goes on and on and on from there. But they have, you know, a thousand plus years of Marx's of Christian civilization that are not yet uh, wiped out. And so, you know, part of what we want to do is say, hey, let's be weird and say Europe is a pretty great place to go uh, to be reinvigorated with a dynamic faith. And reading some of these European thinkers who were kind of dwelling on some of these topics way before most Americans ever considered them, you know, people like Peggy and Vey and people like that, those are, you know, Balthazar, all these people. These are people that we want to, these are people that we want to focus on. So I don't know. What do you yeah. think about our our uh, kind of European fetishism as a weirdness for the gospel? Oh, I I completely sign on to it. And and I and I think it's, it's spectacularly brilliant uh, to, to do that because there is in the very water that Europeans drink, in the architecture that surrounds them every day, there are the remnants of Christian Catholic civilization. Uh, and I mean, it's one of the reasons why I love my favorite city in the world is Rome. And for those listening, if you wanted to bequeath to me enough money that I could retire and live in Rome for the rest of my life I, and continue on my blogging ministry and so forth from Rome, feel free to send your donations. <laughs> because uh, as there's a German word, gemütlich. Uh, that it's hard to translate into English. That it's a sort of just a, a feeling of well-being, a, a, a sense of inner peace and joy and happiness that comes in certain moments. Well, Rome and Europe in general makes me feel gemütlich in this way, and I think that it's more than just happy feelings. I think it's because there's a sense of rootedness and connectedness in in European civilization that Americans don't have. And I think Americans feel it and sense is why we go to Europe by the bazillions every single year. And something, you know, for example, something as simple as the fact that most streets in Rome are old fashioned cobblestones. How inefficient is that? How absurd is that? How wonderful is that? OK, uh, and, and, and that's, I think, an important it's a small thing, but I think it's a very, very important thing. OK, and I think the re weirding of, of Christianity in some ways, is as simple as just going back to the roots of things. Mm-hmm. I think, for example, one I think one of the attractions for a lot of young people of like the traditional Latin mass and parishes that have the TLM and is, is precisely you go in there and the, the women are wearing the veils, the mantillas, and it's this bizarre liturgy in Latin. You know, it's all quiet and hush-hush. 
and everybody has 300 children and you're, you know, and you're looking around and all the men have tweed jackets and beards and, 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 you know, and it's, it's, I'm, this is, I'm painting a caricature, but you get the point. It's almost as if this is a new form of Catholic bohemianism. And, and it's, there's, well, this, this is the attractiveness of it. This is different. This isn't cookie cutter maintenance, suburban cul-de-sac Catholicism. This is middle finger up, stick it in your eye Catholicism. Yep. And, and it's got its horrible rough edges, theologically speaking. All right. But there, th I think that is pretty. I think the liturgy was simply the, the, the raison d'etre for, 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 for many of them. But really, it's a side note. The, the main thing is the, the spectacle of it, the aesthetic of it, the mystique of it. And it was that it's very European, right? It's very Euro, the old mass. And uh, I think that's a great deal part of its attract. And so we talk about the new evangelization and sanctity and, and reweirding Christianity. It could be just as simple as bringing back old world things. Yeah. Well, it's like just being in cities that were built to last. Um, I was watching some video about these, you know, kind of almost like Lego buildings that they're now putting up all over the United States. And they build the foundation at the same time they build the actual building in another on another location. And then they just basically like bring it like a trailer home to the spot. And these are like going up in major cities and you know, Andrew, your piece about like even the uh, AT and T is it AT and T Stadium, uh, the Cowboys? Is that what yeah. it's called? Yeah. I mean, like replacing that in just a couple of years. But here you have, like you said, okay, you you come and you discover, you know, what your our ancestors, you know, built in the past, and it's it's almost a gift for us to this day to imitate that goodness, truth, and beauty that they that that you know, in a way. Yeah, propelled them to make a you know not just a marketplace but a beautiful marketplace that is here to last. And you know, kind of going to that Scruton video, I remember that uh, that Roger uh, Scruton. What, yeah. what? Why beauty? Why beauty matters? I was yeah. just going to bring this up. Well, remember the cafe section when it's like um, he 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 goes into that one section that's just awful, um, which is just it was made by barbarians and you know yeah and it's 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 basically a waste now. But then there's a little kind of like tiny tiny place that could be used for anything, and yet it's people love being there, um, and it serves any purpose. Uh, because the, the, the yeah. architecture doesn't kill the soul. The yeah. architecture lifts you up. You think of, for example, even and it, you don't have to go back 500 years, even in American cities, you have these beautiful old art deco buildings that were like built in the twenties, the yeah. teens, the thirties, my hometown of Lincoln, Nebraska, downtown Bloomington has several of these old art deco buildings. And what you find is that now that they've converted the, the, the they're no longer department stores. They've converted them all to these hipster doofus bohemian, like, coffee shop entertainment areas. And there's a reason for that. Nobody wants to go anymore to the restaurants and the strip malls clear on the end of town. Everybody yeah. comes into downtown Lincoln to go to these old converted warehouses and art deco buildings because those, those buildings have a soul and almost yeah. every major American city is doing exactly the same thing is refurbishing these old gorgeous buildings that have souls, even while they're blowing up and destroying the buildings that they just built 30 years ago out of chrome and glass that nobody wants to be in anymore. And he also then in that video, Scruton talks about the degradation of modern art. It's not just architecture. And he highlights what well, Duchamp's, what well, he calls it, the urinal, the, the, <laughs> the urinal, Duchamp's urinal as the great watershed moment of modern, modern art. You know, and once again, you go to Rome and you find, for example, people will traverse all the way up the Corso to go up to Piazza del Popolo just to, you know, they'll, they'll walk 45 minutes in the hot sun to go see Caravaggio's conversion of, you know, the call of St. Matthew, I believe, you know, in, in one of the twin churches there, Piazza del Popolo. And, mm -hmm. you know, I did that. I walked 45 minutes in hot Roman sun to go see the conversion of, uh, the, call of, of the call of St. Matthew, Caravaggio. Yeah. And I wouldn't have gone that far to go see Duchamp's urinal. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, this reminds me uh, of this phrase that you use, and this might actually have been from, maybe this was from that um, Archbishop Ouellette article that you referenced in your piece, Larry. I don't remember, but you talk about, you say, the saint of today will be someone who can give to people a new kind of binding address. And to me, that really, you know, again, Scruton talked about, like, you know, being a, a somewhere person, not not a no, we're all, I mean, Americans are just nowhere people to so such a high degree. I know I am, and it pains me. I don't want to be. But me I mean, too. Even just, even just since I've had children, I've lived in multiple cities, and I, you know, it just, this sense of, like, where, where do I belong, you know, is really tough. And, um, you know, I just think, like, all what we've been talking about here with art and architecture and Europe and um the aesthetics i think these are ways of of creating that kind of binding that binding yeah, address that uh, you talk about i think the binding address was simply my gloss on quotes from both um uh cardinal Wallet and uh, david l schindler the late david l schindler mm. uh but the i i got that actually from the late uh sociologist peter berger and i believe it was from his book sacred canopy which was written 50 years ago now maybe even 60 and there he talks. He's also the one who came up with the, the phrase plausibility structures. In other words, one of the roles, he's a sociologist, he says one of the roles of culture is that it creates what the French call a mentalité, our way of mm -hmm. looking at things, the eyes, the lens, the filter. So he calls those con those concepts that culture gives us our plausibility structures through which everything gets interpreted. And he says, unfortunately, the plausibility structures of modernity create rootlessness and and existential rootlessness moral rootlessness spiritual rootlessness kind of like with charles taylor's you know buffered self and therefore peter berger says none of us in the modern world have spiritually speaking a binding address mm -hmm. you know uh 500 years ago people knew who they were where they were why they were and that was their binding address okay we don't that's why i say in the piece you know, we were told meet people where they are. But what if people today are nowhere? What if there's no there there mm -hmm. when you knock on their door and nobody's home? It's spiritually speaking, because there's everything is so fungible and fluid. It creates yeah. an entirely new uh, challenge to our evangelizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Schindler has that piece right on homelessness and how every everyone is. Um, everyone's homeless. Everyone's homeless. Um, and I say to people all the time, it's, oh, you're, some people say, you're so judgmental and harsh. No, I'm a leper preaching to other lepers. I'm like what you were saying, Andrew. I mean, I'm infected with the same bacillus of modernity that everybody else is. And, and, and if I'm able to speak it with it to, to it with such force and some, such bluntness and with, to a, with a certain level of anger, it's because the disease is in me. I mm -hmm. feel it. I live it. I breathe it. And that's why I have a con natural instinct for it, where even though I don't have a great deal of empirical evidence, I don't cite studies. I just live and breathe it and therefore exude it in words and say, this is what I see. And, and, and I see it because I feel it. And my whole life is an effort as a Catholic to become sanctified by not trying to rise above that by going around it or over it, but living through it and to live through it and then go up the hill. Yeah, that's so refreshing. I feel that way too, Larry. And I, you know what, I, maybe it's just, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, not quite an old man yet, but I'm definitely getting, I am getting into, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Larry, uh, but I'm certainly getting into my, my middle age now. And, uh, you know, just, just, uh, I don't know, just kind of feeling more comfortable. Uh, we're all hypocrites. And uh, so I don't know, you know, if somebody says to me, Andrew, you know, you're, you're so, you know, you rail against like being bourgeois, but you're so bourgeois. Look at you. I mean, you know, you, you, you know, post Instagram posts about drinking French wine and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I, you know, I, you're right. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about that, but. Oh yeah. I, I, I like to live like a Catholic worker. We, my wife and I live with Dorothy Day called precarity, uh, precarious financially. Uh, yeah. We, we have very, 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 very little money, hardly any. And we just started a fundraiser for the farm and so forth. And yet, and yet, if somebody says, here's $3,000 and a plane ticket to Rome, see you there. I'm there. Yeah, yeah. All right. And I recognize, okay, there's, there's a cognitive dissonance there. It makes me feel like, okay, I'm not, I'm a hypocrite to a certain extent. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I have that well, bourgeois instinct in me. 
Yeah, it's it's hard to shake. It really is. And uh, you know, I just wrote this little piece about the that talks about the the uh, Whit Stillman film Metropolitan. And there's this character, this young man at the beginning, who talks about wanting to. He, he's a devotee of Charles Fourier, and he wants to like go live on a Fourier utopian farm thing. And at the end of the movie, he and his friend are taking a taxi cab from New York City out to the Hamptons to rescue this young woman who's being, you know, potentially ruined by this cad. And, uh, you know, they're riding in a taxi cab wearing J, J press overcoats. And the one says to the other one, you know, I don't think I'd want to live on a farm. And the other one's like, yeah, no, I don't think I would either. You know, so it's like, <laughs> you know, we're all, I guess, you know, you really are doing it, Larry, to some degree. Well, so, yeah, I would to, to a certain extent. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you're so into film. Uh, I'm into Coen Brothers movies myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I can I consider the Cohen brothers. I know we're we're running out of time probably, but I yeah. consider but I know you're here, so I'm gonna pick your brain a bit. I consider the Cohen brother movie Fargo uh to be one of the greatest movies of the of the 20th century myself. Mm. Mm. Was it made in the 20th century? I believe it yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. Uh uh I, I just think it's it's absolutely part of it is because I grew up in Nebraska. And one of the things I love about the Cohen brothers is the manner in which their film captures the essence geographically and culturally of a particular area. So having mm. grown up on the Great Plains, the mm. great scene in Fargo where Steve Buscemi, I can't remember his character's name, you know, is trying to bury the money and he buries it in the snow and then he looks left and he looks right down the fence line. And it's, it's just, this is, I guess, North Dakota. And it's just the same, 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 same for miles. And he, so he takes a little ice, uh, ice scraper, puts in the snow as, as a marker. And that to me was just the Coen brothers absolutely capturing some as of the place, but I bring it up. I bring it up simply because, and I want to pick your brand to me, it, it pertains to what we're talking about today. Um, that holiness can come, can have with it a real simplicity. When we say bring weirdness back again, it doesn't mean let's be complex. Let's be sophisticated. It can be real simplicity because in Fargo, the plot is, <laughs> The plot is, you know, the murder plot, everything is Byzantine. All right. The evil characters are the complicated one. The mm -hmm. heroine, the, the, the woman who has a certain secular sanctity, Margie, is simple. Mm -hmm. She's an utterly simple person. And to me, the high point of the movie is at the very end, they're sitting in the car. She's arrested Peter Strummer, his character. All right. And she sits there and she's lecturing him and she goes, and all for just a little bit of money. There's more to mm -hmm. life than money, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't you know that? And she goes, and she's looking around, and it's freezing outside and snowing. And she goes, and it's such a beautiful day. <laughs> and, and and the thing is, that's pure genius in my mind because what the Coen brothers are capturing there is the simplicity and purity of her sanctity, yeah. what she could call this brutal, cold, snowy day in the plains. You know, it's a beautiful day, and there's and the look Peter Stormer's character gives to her is he just. He doesn't say a word. He just looks at her like, what the F are you talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? In other yeah. words, the light has shown into the darkness or the darkness comprehends it not. Right. Um, well, anyway. yeah. Well, I'll just say this and Bobby might want to say something that we should wrap up. But the, I mean, I, I also think about the Big Lebowski where, I mean, the, the whole plot hinges on a, 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 a um, uh, mixing up two guys and one of them who has a the rug dude. in his apartment that he the likes dude. gets peed upon and he goes <laughs> to try and find retribution and that sets the ball rolling for the whole thing right and and then he ultimately even though he smokes pot and he's you know his life is a mess and all this sort of thing he ultimately he's the one who's in a sense like essence abides like he's and 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 that's a good thing not that other yeah. that other lebowski who's the who's the real yeah. creep the you fat know. rich guy. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so, there's a little Lebowski on the way. That's well, um, that's what I was alluding to by his essence, you know, uh, uh, Okay. Go, but it's more than his essence. It's his, his, it's his genes. It's his everything, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's interesting too, on the Coen brothers, you have though the um, like pregnancy and children and it, perhaps in some ways, what it, it seems to me in the messiness and kind of messed up, world that's really going nowhere that's that's stuck in all of this sin it's kind of the hope in children the children provide that perhaps that that is yeah. the the way forward so yeah and fargo margie's pregnant very yeah. very pregnant yeah. uh as she's out doing her work i mean as, as somebody who i mean raising arizona i remember watching that movie and 
You know, that's another get, one about children. Yeah. yeah. Not to get too like personal here, but you know, when you, when you, uh, not when you learn about like being ch- like potentially childless and all that, it's just, you, you, you learn what gift children are and also orientate, orientating you in a certain way. Like you, you, in some ways you talk about the future, there's like a future there. So yeah. it's a, uh, when I, I watched Raising Arizona, um, I mean, I've seen that movie so many times, but watching it at that particular moment. Uh, and I think one of the Cohen brothers, um, with Francis McDermott, they, I think also they couldn't have children, which was just to me, it's, I have always wondered why children play such an important role in their movies. Yeah. I think it's true. It's true. Yeah. But I don't know what the Cohen brothers' personal worldview might be. It might be utterly hideous for all I know. <laughs> just as I'm sure Woody Allen's worldview is utterly hideous and perhaps even his personal life, but he makes great movies. Yeah, he does. Yeah. And just last note on the children thing. I mean, that's one of the key themes of Charles Piggy's portal to the mystery of hope, right? Is, is yes. children. And, you know, let's face it, maybe the weirdest thing, maybe the weirdest thing we could do is just have children and just have babies, try and have, have babies and raise families or. Well, that's why I listed as part of the weird things, the bohemian things of like the traditional Latin men. When I, you know, people, I get this from people who visit our, our, our Anglican ordinariate parish that I attend. A lot of families there, they're very traditional Catholics. They have families of five, six, seven kids. The pastor of our church has 10 kids. Okay. And I'm not saying everybody needs to now go out and have 10 kids, but it is part of the re stranging of the faith, you know, yeah. when you walk in someplace. And, and so, in other words, I say that as an encouragement out there to any married person that might be listening to this saying, well, how can I live a sanctified life? Have kids. Yeah. <laughs> They'll <laughs> sanctify the heck out of you. <laughs> That's they, cool. they will that that is very true and and uh, and spouses will too and uh, you know there are other ways too so all right well on that note larry what a great conversation we encourage our our, our listeners to go and check out your blog gaudium at spes 22 i mean you you publish at catholic world report very regularly and elsewhere uh, you wrote a great book for ignatius press recently among other things and so there's lots of great stuff where people can can check out your work you got a great podcast we're we're honored to be your friends thank and you. to share share well, this time you. with you so, uh, Larry, thanks so much for taking the time. Hey, thank you. Thank hey, you. Thank Anytime. You, Anytime. All right. Thank you. Well, on that note, everyone, um, if you like this podcast, please do rate it, review it, share it. We're going to do the uh, commodification thing here. I know it's bourgeois, but we would really <laughs> love to spread the message out there for what we're what we're trying to do. So uh, please do tell other people about us and check out our website, spacealvieinstitute.com. Until next time, God bless and live in hope. <laughs>